how's it going, everybody? Uh, I'm Brackner, and this is the Game Collecting Network Roundtable. Uh, here with me today are James, Mike, Steve, and Matt. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. I think we're going to start with a little bit about console modding. Uh, I guess I'll hand it over to Matt. James, one of you guys want to pick up from here? Yeah, I'll just say that we had some news recently about uh, an enhancement, I guess, to an old console, a lot of people's favorite, um, Dreamcast. Uh, James or Mike, I think, are the experts, so either one of you guys can uh, take us through the details. It's pretty much just like uh, an add-on board. What they did was they swapped out the optical drive. Where the connector is, they built a board around that. It's a high-speed port, I guess, and they're able to emulate the GD-ROM drive, and it boots up like an ISO loader, kind of like the Wii key or uh, the 3Key, those little devices that they call jukeboxes. And what makes it pretty cool is, like, you can flash your BIOS on your Dreamcast to actually run, I believe it's called Dream Shell, and what it does is it, it opens up like a little operating system and you can actually load ISO files, CDI images. I believe that they can just plug a USB thumb drive in there or some SD cards and it's full speed, no lag. Sometimes it even runs better than the actual disc. And that's I, I my problem with it. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I just want to go ahead and say, uh, I mean, this is a this is a hard mod to the Dreamcast, but I mean, it, it sounds about as relevant, I guess, as some of the mods that people do to the Ataris and things like that. I mean, there's so many more consoles that can do this better, aren't there? Well, I mean, obviously, yeah. You you can you can emulate Dreamcast on a PC. Um, they've got HD remakes of certain games like Crazy Taxi and stuff like that, but a lot of people, they're purists, so they'll try to keep the games playing on their systems for as long as possible. Even though the drive, the drives are actually garbage. GD-ROM drives are sh total shit. So people are emulating them now, and they're allowing homebrew and stuff straight from the GD bus or whatever they want to call it. And, like... They're just loading up thumb drives full of ROM, uh, ISO images and playing them that way. Obviously, they tell you, hey, uh, back up your disk, whatever, but realistically, let's be real about this, people are probably just going to download them from a BitTorrent website and fill up a bunch of uh, two terabyte thumb drives or whatever. Or, I mean, they even have an IDE board that you can plug in and solder a few lines and actually run an ID hard drive through the back of your Dreamcast now. It's it's ridiculous that they're doing all this stuff on such an old console. It's essentially going to be the, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically like a flash cart for the Dreamcast. Is, it, is that the kind of functionality we're talking about? Do you, have you ever seen the Woad for the Nintendo Wii? I have. Right, it's the Wii Optical Drive Emulator, and what it is, is it basically, it's like a jukebox. Like, you select the title through an external keypad, and then you click play, and then it'll make the console think that that disc is in the drive. So, yeah, realistically, it's it same same concept as having a flash card for, like, a Nintendo DS or something. The reason why I wanted to mention that is because you talked about it running faster than discs, and I run a, a soft modded Wii, and very similar, I mean, you get less load times and, and less lag in certain parts of games because it doesn't have to read everything right off the disc, it has it in hard data, and so it's not surprising that the Dreamcast has the same, uh, same effect. Right, that's like, um, I was real big into Xbox modding back in the day, and uh, the 360, you can actually modify the 360 either by JTAG or what they call the RGA check, it, which they actually force the processor to reset a few times and it tricks it to load unsigned code into a custom firmware or whatever. But um, loading games from USB, you're loading 4 to 8 gigabyte images on newer consoles and, I mean, USB does what? Six, six megabit per second. I I don't know how fast a USB bus is. Faster than disk loading, which is the point, right? Right. Yeah. I I don't want to get technical. I've been drinking tonight, so I, I don't. I can't really answer too many technical questions because my brain's kind of. But um, 
if you're loading an ISO off of a hard drive that's hooked up via a 6 gigabit per second SATA port, obviously it's going to be faster than loading th off of a disk through the cache of a DVD drive, through the SATA, loading in memory and all that. I mean, you're loading all of this stuff in memory or just the executable and then reading all the files from a hard drive. When it comes to these mods and stuff, it's, it, it's mind-blowing the stuff that they can do with these things. Oh yeah, I've seen um, I've seen people use Raspberry Pis as hosts or netbooting Naomi's now. It's crazy what they've done. So James, you uh, we talked about this a little bit, but I guess you know you're pretty familiar with this as well. I know you've done some light console modding, and we have Crazy um, in the chat room who does a lot of console modding as well. How does this on par with some of the other mods we've seen done on older consoles work-wise? Well, work-wise, I don't know. For the most part, with newer stuff, it's all soft modding or or getting a pre-programmed chip or whatever and putting in there with directions. On older consoles, you'd always have to... The, the mods were different. You'd you would do video or power mods. You'd have to track down where the video goes, what signal's being sent where. It's a completely different beast. Yeah, when it comes to like uh, more modern consoles like the PlayStation or the Dreamcast or the GameCube, um, like the PlayStation has chips. Obviously, that chip has a little bit of code on it to alter the boot of a, any disc or whatever. And then you've it. With newer consoles, like after 1995, I'm going to say, it's all chips with BIOSes or even hardware add-on boards. Um, with the current uh, PlayStation 3 mods, they're actually using downgraders that they have to keep in the system to load previous firmware in order to run homebrew on that system. With uh, the, the original Xbox... They had mod chips, which were like six wires. You plugged it in after you flash a BIOS to it, and then you can load whatever you wanted off the hard drive. Um, now with the Dreamcast, they're actually completely replacing the GD-ROM drive and emulating that. But there is a problem with all these modern mods anyways. You lose the collectability of your games. Suddenly you're just downloading ISOs instead of buying new games and stuff. I mean, realistically, here's how I see it. If I can mod a console, all right, and I can load my games onto a hard drive or a USB thumb drive or a SD card or something, I'd rather do that and uh, keep my discs from getting damaged. Because, I mean, if you don't use them, you're less likely to get disc rot, anything like that. And you're less likely to scratch them. You're less likely to misplace them. Just keep them nice tidy on a shelf and load your stuff up via a hard drive or SD card. There's also the point, and this has been made before in other emulation conversations, maybe this isn't the right format I guess for it, but one of the big draws I think is that I'm going to play games that I wouldn't otherwise play using emulation than I would, you know, owning the game. That's absolutely correct. Like, I downloaded every Super Nintendo ROM when I had an old Xbox, and I played so many games that I've never even heard of. Like, the average person knows Mario and Zelda, Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, and all that stuff, but they don't know classic games. Like, they don't really know that Mega Man had a bunch of games in Japan that never came over here. They don't know that our uh, Final Fantasy three isn't really Final Fantasy 3, stuff like that. So, through emulation and people being curious, they find out more stuff, and then they end up wanting... How I got into gaming, I would download the stuff, emulate it, pirate it, or whatever, and then I would... Honestly, I would buy these games, because I found out what they were, I wanted to see how they played on the actual hardware, and my computer was shit at the time, so obviously I wasn't able to emulate PlayStation or PS2 or anything like that, so I had to go out and buy the stuff. 
Absolutely. And the other side of um, console mods, I guess, and we touched on a little bit, but like power mods on older consoles or AV mods, especially I know the NES RGB is uh, really popular. But uh, what are some, some of the classic mods that you've heard or what are your thoughts on it? Um, Steve, any thoughts? Um, one mod that I've, I've seen come up quite often is backlights on the original Game Boy. It's it's not a mod that's really one of my favorites, just because the Game Boy games can be played on a much better console, in my opinion. Sure, the Game Boy is a classic, but you can't stow it away and carry it around with you as easily as you can as a Game Boy Advance SP. And I, I feel by adding the backlight to the Game Boy, people are just creating a bigger, bulker Game Boy SP. Actually, I'd like to step in here because most of the mods to the original Game Boy are being done in the interest of chiptunes, and I think those backlights are a big part of the chiptune community. That's actually a good point that you make. Um, they've even gone as far as creating programmable flash cards through, like, USB ports where you can actually build a synthesizer out of the uh, out of the Game Boy. For some weird reason, these guys love these Game Boys. They paint them all kinds of fruity ass colors, backlights that are like neon red, and they'll have knobs and stuff, and they'll just use it to mix up mix up uh, songs on the fly. Well, I, I, I can see it from that point where people were actually using it, but I used to work for a game store, and I had a guy come in and sold the owner. Game Boys are modified with backlights. They have sat there for three years. Nobody wants them. It's just it's just one of those things that if you want the mod done, you're going to go out and get it done. You're not going to go looking around for a store that has it. All right. Well, it also depends on what they're asking for them. I mean, those, I feel they can be done for pretty cheap. You can get an old school DGB-001 for next to nothing, and the backlight mod doesn't cost a whole lot if you know what you're doing. So I mean, what what what's the store asking for them? I mean, are they wanting a hundred bucks for them, a hundred fifty? Because I, I see them online sometimes going for that. Personally, I don't I don't even remember what we were asking for them because nobody ever asked us a like a price on them. So I never even found out. And the, the store I worked at was one of those stores that just didn't have price tags. So right, but well, if they've been modded for backlights and chip tunes, somebody's probably gone into them and bypassed the headphone amplifier for the quote-unquote pro sound, then you can't use headphones on them anymore. That's true, too. Once you mod the uh, the audio, the speaker, usually you can't you can't set them up for headphones anymore. I, I like them. I think they look really cool. I think they're an easy project for most people. I don't think they're a good thing to do to try to f resell to make money off of them because, as Steve said, they are going to just sit there and sit there because most people who want that type of thing can go out and do it themselves. Right, because... What realistically, you're buying uh, a ten dollar screen and just unscrewing it and what adhering it to the back of a regular uh, LCD screen. Uh, there's a little bit more than that too. There's a little soldering involved also. But yes, I mean that's it. Really boils down to that's all. It, that's all it is. But the I mean, like you said, the old the old Game Boys they don't cost anything. I mean, if somebody wants to paint it and backlight it for show, I mean, why not? Who didn't own a Game Boy as a kid? Who's not going to appreciate that? Just from a collector's standpoint. Right, right. I I agree with that completely. And your comment about you know not building them to resell. If you want to offer it as a service, and I think Crazy does a little bit of that with NES stuff. But, you know, offering the modding to the people who want it. Because if you do want it, you're going to find a way to get it done. Either do it yourself or find somebody to do it. But to build it up to sell the actual items, I think it's perfectly understandable, Steve, that those things sat for so long. Because the secondary market on one that's already done is probably really low. Right. It, it, it's a pain in the ass. Once, you, once stuff's modded, it's act people think, oh, well, I can put these together and I can sell them on eBay or whatever. No, it is a pain in the ass to sell modified hardware. Um, like, I mean, back in the day, I was, I, what was it, 2006, 2005, 2006, sell, selling, like, fully modded Xbox consoles. After they started doing soft mods, 
my chip sales went down. The only people that were actually buying them were quote unquote chip installers. But these guys would install these chips in their Xboxes and their inventory would just fucking sit there for months on end. And they ended up selling them at a loss in order to get rid of their stock. Well, I think the big thing with handhelds is mostly aesthetic mods. I mean, that's what people want to see, but it's something you really need to do probably more on a commission based, or if you're going to do it, just do it for yourself. Right, like, people people aren't going to buy a handheld that somebody already customized. Like, it, if I were to get a handheld customized, it would be something with my personal touch to it, and I would find somebody with a steady hand, and they would actually be able to do it for me. I'm not going to buy a pre-modded DS that's painted for somebody else. And, I mean, it, it goes for the same with, like, controller mods. I mean, tons of people buy these custom controllers with, like, bullet buttons and stuff like that. Uh, the only thing that I could see myself buying, realistically, would be, say, an Xbox, an original Xbox 360 controller, where they redid the LEDs around the ring. That would be something I'd buy, or a pre-modified for, like, uh, I don't know, auto fire or something like that. What about you guys? I know the Smash boards are covered with GameCube mods for, you know, everybody's got a, a Fox controller, a Kirby controller, or what have you. I think they look pretty cool. Uh, one of the controller mods I really like and actually want to do as a little side project is actually making classic controllers of wireless, like the NES and the Super Nintendo. I, I love playing the systems, but being tied down to, a to uh, the wire isn't always um, convenient for me. Amen. Now, can you actually add wireless controllers to older consoles like the NES or Super Nintendo or anything like that? Because I had no idea that was even possible. Uh, I, I've been looking into this for the past year, and someone has actually gone out and completely modified an original. Uh, I think he did like NES, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and I think it was like Sega Saturn. He completely went in there and soldered on like a sieber and a, a sender to actually send a signal to a little box that he custom made that would go into the controller port and he would put like a, I think it was like an iPod mini rechargeable battery into it and he said it lasted him I, I believe up to 8 hours That is awesome I would buy the hell out of that So it's, it's kind of like he made wave birds for the NES and stuff Exactly yeah, but what about the uh, the the frequency or what have you? I mean, could you do more than one in a room, or is there going to be interference if you try to get several of them set up? The the way he he set it up is I think it had like four channels because the the maximum controller ports on I think any console was four. So he set it up to where I think there was like four uh, channels that it would send and receive, and he, there was just a little dip switch that he would he would. Uh, change it to, to set up the different frequencies. Well, from what I understand, most of those uh, wireless ones, they run on that uh, 2.4 uh, megahertz. I, I really don't know what it is exactly, but I've heard there's a lot of issues when you get other electronics around them. Uh, just going back to Smash Brothers, I hear a lot of people talk about the lag on the wave bird, and it's noticeable once you get several electronic devices that are wireless together. So I I mean, it's cool, but, I mean, do you know much about what he was using exactly? Um, from, what I, from what I read, I, I don't remember him mentioning anything about lag. It's just one of those things that you would have to try out at first. Um, if it's a game I've never played before, I, I probably wouldn't notice it, but if I was playing in, like, Mario or something, I'd probably notice it right away. There's always, with any wireless controller, there's going to be a little bit more lag, just because it takes longer, even if there's no interference, than it is on a hardwired connection. And that's why you see all of the competitive gamers using nothing but wired controllers. But for casual play, I think that that would be a blast, especially if it has decent range. Yeah, I think, I don't remember exactly, but I believe he said it was about 20 feet. It was the range he was getting on him. And uh, another That's thing impressive. he was actually able to do with it was he was actually able to mix and match controllers to different systems. So I think he was actually using a Sega Saturn controller on the Genesis. 
because of the way he set up the frequencies. Well, I suppose if you uh, get the button mapping right, then you'll be good to go, as long as the receiver can translate it right. Yeah, I think that that falls into more along the lines of um, of a FPGA board, where it's it's reading the input of the controller, and it's reading those different controllers, and then it's just output outputting it into the same format for all of them. That way, like the receiver and the the fuck. That way, like the receiver is just reading one signal it's not programmed for every different signal so like if you press A on any of those controllers it's telling the receiver hey A was pressed make that fucker jump and that's it well there's uh, there's something else I've seen in controller mods that we haven't touched on here um, I've seen mods where people have taken the silicone plungers out of their game pads and put little tack switches in behind them And supposedly it increases performance, it increases response time or whatever. But I've never seen a difference myself. I've tried it. I've never seen a difference. I, I don't guess I understand what you're talking about exactly. You can elaborate? It, it sounds like... It sounds like he's, he's talking about uh, modifying a controller to have mechanical switches. Oh, I just went away from me. Um, yes, so what I was talking about was putting little mechanical switches in behind the buttons in a gamepad where the silicone plungers would have been before. Making it like a clicky keyboard. Exactly. That's, that sounds like something that the, the hardcore uh, fighter gamers, that's something they would notice and that most casual gamers wouldn't pick up on. Yeah, man, I'm not going to pick that up if I'm button mashing playing Mortal Kombat, but <laughs> I'll probably notice if I'm I'm playing a game for hours on end against other people, but if I'm just playing on my couch with a couple friends, I'm not really going to notice a big difference. So yeah, definitely, you know, with the mods, it feels like that they, they really fall into three different categories. You've got some that are for performance, whether that's controller mod or, you know, what have you. Then we've got the aesthetic, of course, mods, and that would include the backlight and painting and um, some of that custom stuff. And then the functionality mods, I guess, for lack of a better term, where your AV mods and um, emulation enabling mods, if you will, the what we think of, you know, with Wii mods and X mod, Xbox mods. Well, if that's the case, I would almost say a backlight falls into those last, both of those last two, because it's it's very functional also, as well as aesthetic. Yeah, as much okay. as I dislike the ones on the original Game Boy, there's a mod for the Game Boy Advance, the original Game Boy Advance, that I think backlights it or front lights it or something, and it actually looks pretty damn good. I actually had one of those, and um, I don't know if it was just a shitty installation or if it was the way they put it back together, but it's yes, it does make the screen brighter, but out of the corner of your eye or whatever, along the edge of the screen, you'll see the LED or whatever they use to brighten it. Yeah, you see that a lot in the original Game Boy installations, too. There's just that bright little diffuser right on the end that makes... it shines through on you, you know? Right, right. Uh, well, I, I, I think that's enough of mods. We spent almost a half hour talking about it, so what's up on the schedule, guys? Well, I was, uh, I think we touched on it prior to the show, but uh, we want to talk about maybe a little bit of the future of retro, of older gaming. I mean, there's so many HD remakes these days. What's what? What's next? What are we looking at? I know uh, there was a leak recently of a Wii U HD remake coming out next year. I'm going to go ahead and cut you off right there. I don't want to talk about the Wii U HD remake because if we mention it being anything involving a certain little guy who may or may not be an elf and is constantly confused as being a female, uh, we might not get it. Kind of like mentioning Half-Life 3. So, yeah, stay off the Wii U subject. Aw, uh, you scared to jinx it. I thought that that was going to be on the 3DS anyway. Like, uh, like um... That other 
Ocarina of shut, Time. I'm going to go ahead and say the name. Shut, on the nah, shut up. Nope. Shit. Shush. Quiet. Okay, okay, okay. If the future of retro gaming is in virtual console exclusives, if you look for Earthbound, that's only on Wii U, but not on 3DS. You know, stuff like that. Which is total shit, because that is a perfect game for handheld. Okay, so we got past the whole gene scene of a certain little green and maybe a transgender character. Um, 3D, 3DS, they've got quite a few games that have been remade. I mean, you got you got Mario 64. They added a little bit more functionality, cleaned up the graphics a little bit. You got Zelda Ocarina of Time 3DS. Um, I like the Wind Waker remake that they did for the Wii U. Uh, I, I'm kind of hoping that they actually release a new Star Fox game instead of a HD remake of Star Fox, because we haven't had a good Star Fox game in so long. I thought it was confirmed uh, that there was going to be a new Star Fox game for the Wii U. That was just a tech demo. It was not confirmed whether or not we're actually getting a game. I didn't realize. But speaking of so, new uh, games on Nintendo systems... I did uh, did read an article a while back, right around Nintendo's E3, that Metroid will be getting a 2D and a 3D uh, game within the next year and a half, so that's exciting. Oh yeah? Well, he learned how to duck? Yeah, Metroid, he's such a great guy. He's almost as good as Halo. What are some of the franchises... Sorry, my mic fell down. Um, I was just saying, what are some of the... The games that you think deserve an HD remake. We talked about Wind Waker and how that worked out so well, and DuckTales is another one that recently got a remix from from way back in the NES days. What are some other games you guys think deserve an HD remake that haven't been rumored or touched on before? Uh, well, I was gonna say Super Mario Sunshine, but you said haven't been rumored, and that one has been rumored. So, but Super Mario Sunshine definitely. You know, you know what? Like I I'd actually like to see them release HD remakes of rare titles. Like DuckTales 2, an HD remake of DuckTales 2 would be awesome. I mean, that's one of the from my experience one of the hardest games for the original Nintendo. Um an HD remake HD of maybe Snow Bros. Uh, <laughs> an HD Snow Bros. <laughs> You heard me. HD uh, Stadium event. Uh, let's not do that one. What about Bubble Bobble? <laughs> Bubble Bobble actually might look pretty good as a HD if they go like the the route DuckTales Remastered did. And you'd have a wider screen so you can make bigger puzzles? They're not going to release any games like that because you got shit like Bubble Witch Saga on Facebook. I mean, a lot of those games have been like bastardized by King, so they're not going to remake them when you can just download it from an app store. It, they kind of they kind of fucked that up for themselves by letting people make games like that. Yeah, a lot of the puzzle games got just endless remakes and clones and hacks or whatever on Facebook and mobile and, and everything like that. What about um, some non-puzzle games you guys would like to see? What about a good shooter like, since we're stuck on Capcom, 1942? I would, I would love that. I, I absolutely love that game in, um, in the arcade. Seeing an HD remake of that would just blow me away. Ooh, I would love it. Ooh, hold on. You would have to turn your screen sideways to play it. They would Using have to the include that for me to. Use the game pad. That would be so awesome. No, you know what? And uh, uh, true to the original Pilot Wings. Yes. I would play that. Dude, I I had the Super Nintendo version and I played the fuck out of that game. What are some What are some types of things that they can do to these games to give them a little bit extra? Um, Ducktales, for instance, one of the things you could obviously the levels were a tad bit bigger, I think, and had a few more items in them. Um, but you could unlock all the old music. What are some things that like a 1942 HD remake could do, other than being just a little bit bigger, a little bit longer? Uh, I think. Everybody likes to see achievements. Some sort of achievement system would be pretty cool. Probably uh, some way to set up different, uh, I guess, more weapons or more planes or what have you would probably be kind of neat. 
Well, a time warp system. Well, see, the time warp system, like you just called it. Honestly, I gotta hand it to the guys at three four three because what they're doing with like the Halo anniversary collections is it's it's pretty cool. Like you can switch between the original version and the new upgraded HD version. What pissed me off in the first uh, Halo anniversary was there was a slight lag switching from the old engine to the new engine. But from what I've seen for uh, Halo 2 Anniversary, it's seamless. Like, as soon as you hit the button, it's like, bing, done. Brand new graphics. And they're talking about keeping all the original gameplay, that it's just a graphical update. And they're, oh, God, thinking about it makes me want to go out and buy an Xbox One right now. Okay, that's that's actually fantastic. I, I'm been looking forward to Halo. But I was talking about, like, for 1942, bring back the old concept of an extra game after you finish the game. So after you beat 1942, you go into a big portal or whatever, and you come out at the beginning of 1943. What about a straight pixel-for-pixel pixel, um, instance of the original game also found within I think that would be pretty cool. That would be appreciated by a lot of fans. I was just going to say that there are some games that have that. I think one of the Splatterhouse games has one of the originals able to be unlocked once you get to a certain point. Um, Animal Crossing, one of the iterations of that, unlocked some NES games that you could play the full versions of. So that type of thing has been done, but I think it would be cool to see after getting through the HD, you can also go back and say, well, you know, how exactly well did it translate and play the original game, too? You know, the the last Smash Brothers game did that, too. The one, the Smash Brothers Brawl for Wii, they had where you can unlock little, you know, two- and three-minute demos of a lot of the characters' levels, which was pretty cool. How do you guys feel about Amiibos? Those little figurines that are going to power you up in Smash Brothers. I think I'm going to go broke buying all of them. I, I agree. I'm I'm gonna buy every single one of them. I, I wish that they had more the whole characters. Skylanders thing. Uh, from what I understand, they're gonna have pretty much everybody eventually. Uh, Matt. Well, if that's the case, that's gonna be awesome because uh, I know that there's only a few on launch. But if they re eventually release all the Smash Brothers characters in the amiibo, yeah, I will go broke. And they've already showed two different Mario amiibos also, which is awesome, I think. And this is where I step in and have to play devil's advocate. Honestly, I think all of you are fucking stupid. It's, it's going to be a waste of money. Oh god, yes, there's there's absolutely going to be exclusives with stats so high that normal people can't get them. And they're going to be That's not how it's going to work. No, no, no. That's not dude, how it's going to work. Dude, they're doing it with... Dude, really? They're doing it with... Uh, the Disney shit. They're doing it with um, that shit Rappo worked on, uh, Skylanders. Like it, it's not, just going to be not mandatory for gameplay, though. They're not mandatory. They are a a additional thing that if you want to get, you can get. If you don't want to get, you don't have to get. Think of, think of them like this. They're they're pretty much a memory card that if you want to go to your friend's house and you want to use your stats that you get that you got on Mario Kart. Like I think. They're probably going to end up putting, like, you can put your time trials on it. It's just like something you can take to your friend's house without having to lug your Wii U over to him. See, I I don't like that, man. It's like a gimmicky fucking... It's like... It, it's it's gimmicky, alright? Realistically, how often how often do you use the, D, the 3D functionality on your 3DS? Just answer that question. I keep mine on the minimum 3D all the time, always. There's no fucking way I can play a game in 3D. It's a gimmick. It's it's fucking garbage. I'm sorry. I love Nintendo. They have a special place in my heart, but they're too fucking gimmicky, and these Amiibo things are absolutely retarded. Them. You're not required to have them to play any game. But right, you're probably but if you... required to have them to keep up with other players. No, no, no. Not... That's not how they're going to do it. That's not how they're going to do it. It's you don't. It doesn't enhance it. From what I understand, to touch on that, the all of your everything that it does to enhance, because I think it will increase stats in Smash Brothers, but it's not going to be online or competitive play. It's just for the friendly version or the friendly games that you have with your friends. Some of that, maybe battle right. rec, just local play. Okay. In that note, let me explain to you something. Those 
those devices, I, they're NFC or whatever, they're so insecure that people will find a way to alter those things. With my son, he had, he's seven years old, all right? His Skylanders are all maxed out. You know why? Because I downloaded them on my computer using his USB portal, updated all of his characters, and nobody can fuck with his Skylanders. That boy goes crazy. I mean, he can't play the game. He doesn't know what the fuck he's doing, but he's having fun while he's doing it because his guys are badasses. They I don't kind of see online. that. Right, but it's local play. You're on a couch with your buddies, and you're being a dick by holding your amiibo in your pocket, and your friends are looking at you like, what the fuck, dude? Anyway, aside from amiibos, what other HD remakes do you guys want to see? Beyond Good and Evil. I'd like an authentic remake of Theme Park. I'm talking Bullfrog Theme Park. None of this uh, bullshit that they try to throw down our throats on like an app store or anything like that. I want a authentic theme park experience. <laughs> or even theme hospital. Theme hospital was fun. You know, my choice is going to be something probably a lot of people have never heard of before, but I would love to have a modern Jill of the Jungle. That game blew my mind as a little boy, and it probably would blow my mind as an adult if I would sit and play it. I, I'm not too sure on, like, a modern Jill of the Jungle, but, like, more, like, just an updated graphics kind of thing I think would be pretty cool, because I, I, I played the hell out of the game, too. It was on my sister's computer. Okay, okay, maybe SNES level. That would that would be about it. SNES level. That's about as far as you could go with it. Yes, definitely. It, I, I love the graphics on the SNES, and any, anything done in the 16-bit era was just gorgeous. It's a piece of work, actually. A piece of art. I... I just feel like I could smack you right now. That was out of nowhere. Sorry, I just can't stand people who say SNES or NES. It's like, what? More HD remakes. Uh, with Nintendo recently um, acquiring the rights to use Mega Man from Capcom in their new Smash Brothers, I've always seen some more Mega Man games. I mean, is that even possible? I know they have the Mighty Number no. 9 coming out by, by the... Uh, original creator of Mega Man, but, I mean, come on, can't we see something, like a new Mega Man or Mega Man X, please? Well, honestly, man, I I have to say, that, like, I, I, like I told you guys, I wasn't a big Nintendo fan, but Mega Man was one of those games that I could pick up and I could have hours of fun playing, even though it was hard as shit, but the way Capcom is treating the Mega Man franchises right now, it's like, it's, why the hell would they just ignore an entire IP? Nintendo treats that IP better than Capcom does. Is it possible Nintendo could buy the IP from them? I mean, is that a thing? Uh, actually, yeah. Um, you can buy an IP from another company. I mean, look at, look at Microsoft taking over Rare. They bought the studio and right. like they own they own the IP for Conquer that was a Nintendo IP they own the IP for Killer Instinct I mean they're not doing great with them but they own them um they don't own Donkey Kong but uh I think they, I mean, they, I think they actually they own family. the family members yeah, yeah they, they own, own the, they own the family Kong. members that were created by Rare for Nintendo they own those characters, but not Donkey Kong himself. Yeah, really? they just don't own Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong. Uh, Are you serious? I so they, I think, but I think Nintendo still owns the Kremlings and King K. Rool, because the Kremlings are supposedly in the new uh, Smash Run and the new Smash Brothers game, from what I understand. Well, this means okay. no HD remake of Donkey Kong 64. Actually, that doesn't, because Nintendo and Microsoft are actually. They actually have partnered with franchises and stuff before. Um, I, Nintendo and Microsoft are a good competitive relationship. They're not going to intentionally, like, completely fuck each other over. I can see Microsoft being like, hey, <laughs> we own this, but it, it, it's technically your, your IP. So here, you can use it as long as there's a notice for Microsoft Game Studios or some shit in the game. I mean, look at, uh, look at, um, I don't know if any of you guys have played it, but Banjo-Kazooie on Xbox Live Arcade, they remade the game, okay, 
But the only thing Nintendo that they cut out was the floating N on the intro screen. There's still an N64 sitting on Banjo's dresser. Oh, that, that brings up some interesting ideas, though. Like cameos from other IPs and games where they're not owned. Um, Mario That's and Sonic common. were in a background tile in Turrican. To be honest, Sega is Nintendo's official third party now. Like, Sega's not really its own shit. Sega is Nintendo's official bitch. I love it. Was I mean, it, I think as a kid, I, I wanted that all my life. Was there really any other way for it to end? Yeah, Nintendo games running on Sega systems. Shut the fuck up. All right, well, that should probably wrap it up for HD Remix, but on a on a related topic, as we get into the next gen of, of gaming, a lot of titles are coming out where they're digital only or download only rather than just being updates to physical games. So what are some of the games that you think are AAA titles or should be um, highly recognized that are digital only? Uh, Steve, any thoughts on that? Capcom, within I think it was like within the past year, has said that they're going to start releasing AAA titles via uh, digital release only. And one of the most notable ones that I remember them saying was the new uh, Ace Attorney series or the, the new Ace Attorney game, which was Dual Destinies in the Americas. It was only released on digital uh, version. And I absolutely love the series. And in order to have a physical copy of the game, I had to go and order a copy from Japan just to have with me. So I, I, I think it's bullshit that I have to have a physical copy and a digital copy. Knowing the physical copy, I can never play because I don't know Japanese and I have to actually go to that um, digital release of it. Um, As a collector, can I just say I'm not a big fan of digital releases. I mean, I I love to have a physical item. I love to be able to shelf it and look at it on the shelf. And I, I hate games that are digital release only almost. I mean, it's convenient and it's great. There's a lot of good ones out there. Look at a uh, Shovel Knight that was a Kickstarter recently. It's doing amazing, and I mean I haven't played it yet, but I've watched a lot of videos on it, and it looks like a great game. But I don't want to download it. I want a damn physical copy. What about like Super Meat Boy? Would that be considered a AAA title? It, it was an indie game, but it sold so well. I would actually categorize it as a AAA title now. So it, its success as a digital title drove it to become a physical release, which is, uh, I think, an excellent point and uh, a really good transition because also the, what do I want to say, the um, indie game market, it makes distribution so easy and so cheap for some of these titles or some of these developers to get games out. Um, you know, back in the day when it was all physical, there, there probably wouldn't have been enough support for a game like Super Meat Boy to even come out and see play anywhere other than shareware on the internet or something. Not only that, Matt, but look at how much shovelware gets pushed out and still gets pushed out. This should probably be something that's only tried as a digital download before we have to see it on a shelf. I don't know, man. I would totally buy a retail copy of uh, Goat Simulator. That game is too fun for a such a goofy ass sandbox game. Like it, it, it's understandable for uh, in, indie companies to release it as digital only. There, there's less um, risk involved. But I, I'm more of talking by established companies like Capcom and Nintendo uh, going out and going out of their way to only release a digital copy of their game. Same with the uh, NES Remix One and Two. Uh, I believe Japan got a physical copy, but we have not over here. The U.S. will get a physical copy of that, but you're absolutely right. And there was a lot of complaining about that at the time, too. It seemed like a great uh, great game to get a physical copy, but didn't get one. Uh, also, go back to Capcom, Mega Man 9 and 10. Wish there was a physical copy of those. I, I would, uh, in general, be in support, I guess, of the bigger studios doing some digital download. Um, I'm not a big fan of the DLC, I guess, if it was one way or the other. I would rather see the games be full download rather than adding downloadable content to physical games. But you're absolutely right. The collector, I w all things being equal, would rather have physical copies of the game. But if there's got to be DLC, I'd rather the whole game be downloaded than 
just that part, like microtransactions, like like that 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 brings me to like this. Um, I understand like Bethesda gets a lot of flack for stupid shit like horse armor as DLC. I mean that that's fucking dumb, but I gotta hand it to those guys. Uh, most DLC is what, back in the day, we would call it, like, expansion packs, obviously, where it adds multiple hours of gameplay. And nowadays, you do not see that in retail very much. But Bethesda, for, like, Fallout 3, they actually released a DLC on disc, where you can just go out, buy it, install it on your, your memory card or whatever you had on your Xbox or your PlayStation, and you're good to go. Like, that... That was actually pretty cool, in my opinion. Like, bring back expansion packs. None of this DLC downloadable content bullshit. I don't want to have to download, like, like with uh, Capcom and Dead Rising. You had to buy a bunch of stupid fucking keys to unlock certain costumes. That shit's stupid. Bring back getting a certain score and unlocking certain stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, I would love to play a game... Like, I mean, Mario Kart 8 does it. You play for a certain amount of time, you collect the, those coins, you unlock new racers. You play a certain cup, you unlock new levels. Like, that stuff, that's how it should be. And they should roll all the other shit into an expansion pack, not individual pro- DLC. What you run into and what I see a lot of complaints about is that the DLCs are being used as bug fixes after the fact, and so they're rushing these games before they're even ready to be released. Um, you hear a lot of people complaining, you know, day one of a game release, you got to download a patch in order for it to run right. Um, so I I think that, that that's generally my opinion on, on DLC and, and uh, patching, things like that. You know, don't be sloppy when you're making the game. Right, but realistically, that's a gift and a curse. I mean, day one patches are annoying, of course, but then again, you it it's not just with modern consoles. It's just more apparent with modern consoles. I mean, look at look at Rage Wars Turok for the N64. I mean, there's thousands of copies of a game that are unplayable after a certain point in the game. And realistically, those tiny little bugs where you got to download a one megabyte patch or something, it it, it it's going to happen. I mean. They miss certain things, the game goes gold, it's playable, and then while they're waiting to actually release it, after they started burning all these discs for retail, some dude's like, oh, yeah, I forgot to send this paperwork in. Uh, yeah, Fallout New Vegas, Doc's head starts to flip upside fucking down. Okay, release a day one patch. Let's fix it. Can I just say, uh, I'm sorry, thinking about all the day one patches and the, the, the bug fixes later, could you imagine if back in the NES days, back in our childhood, if they had bug fixes for NES games? I mean, like, you could, like, mail it in and they send it back fixed. How hilarious that would be. They did for a few of them. What? Okay, maybe not NES, but they they did update, you know, they did release later games with updates in them, newer versions. But like, well, that's what, what was it? Uh, Turok on the in the Nintendo 64. Was it Turok Rage Wars? <laughs> you had to mail in for a. Have you have you been here? Yeah, he just welcome. talked about welcome. But there, there was uh, there are a few games besides Rage Wars that that had that happen, but as a much more subtle way. Banjo Kazooie is one that I actually think of when I think of this. In the original version of Banjo Kazooie, you, there are multiple glitches, like uh, the, the jiggy that you get on top of the anthill, pretty much at the beginning of the game by hitting the, the grunty switch. You can actually reach that in the original version, the, the first release of the game, by jumping off the mountain and jumping back onto it. You can actually climb that. And in the later versions of the game, they actually patch that. They're, 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 that's why when you look at cartridges, they're the, on there it always says like version 1.1, 1.3b. Right, yeah. Um, and what a lot of people don't know, well, alright, I'm not going to say what a lot of people don't know, but I'm going to go with it. GoldenEye was so popular, it, it a lot of copies, original copies, were sent through. But apparently, in later copies, you can shoot odd job when that fucker's crouching. That's only in newer copies, or original copies of the game. Apparently that was an actual bug. Like, he should have been able to get shot. 
And every douchebag who chooses this odd job when playing Goldeneye was you. You just want to reach over and smack the little sucker. Right, but apparently that that was a bug. That was something that could have been patched with a day one patch. So somebody explain the odd job bug. Uh, odd job's the best player or the best character just because he's th that way he crouches. The, the it's glitched, I guess. Okay, it it, it goes like this, like. Odd job is the bane of every N64 gamer's existence. Uh, not only did they give him a short character model, but the hitboxes, I guess you would call it, on Odd Job when he crouches are almost non-existent. Like, Odd Job is not allowed to be played in my house. If you fucking select Odd Job, I will shank you in your throat. It's it's that rage inducing. Fair used enough. to say that about playing Bo Jackson in Tecmo Super Bowl. It was so broken that you could always win with him no matter what. Yeah, Bo Jackson's overrated. QB Eagles is where it's at. That's kind of like, um, in, uh, I used to play Madden a few years back. Madden 06, uh, onside kicks were insane. There is no way people can miss an onside kick. Like, you collect an onside kick and the AI was so fucking dumb you could run for a touchdown every time. Like, we had to ban onside kicks in my house. So I think that probably wraps up uh, downloadable only games and the DLC topic. What, uh, did anybody have any good finds this week? Uh, well, actually, I found something pretty cool at Half Price Books. Uh, Final Crisis, paperbound, complete collection. I got it for like $4. I like comic books, Batman, Superman, all that shit. I also found a retail copy of the original Fallout. So that's exciting. I mean, I've already got it on Steam, but to actually have it sitting on a shelf, that's nice. And I, that was like mm, six bucks. And I picked up Homefront. I know a lot of people bitch about it because it was so hyped up, but I've seen videos and it looks it looks like it's something I'd enjoy. I picked that up for three dollars. So I mean, just a couple PC games and oh, and uh, I picked up Super Mario Galaxy uh, Collector's Edition. Player's Guide, hardbound book with a big old shiny star That's on it. That's beautiful. That book is so beautiful. I love it. The first one and the second one are gorgeous. Yeah, I thought I thought that was pretty cool. I got it for dude. I got it for like four bucks. It's black with a shiny silver star on the cover. Yeah, uh, Galaxy Two is white with a shiny silver star on it. That is some sexy, sexy marketing. Uh, not exactly any stills or anything this week. I've got a, a couple games coming in. As I'm sure you know, Matt. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I got a, a, a DSIXL on Craigslist recently for my daughter. Uh, not really a still or nothing. I mean, it was, you know, 20 bucks less than FMV, but I'm happy to be getting that for her. She's excited, and we're going to be getting her some Nintendo dogs to play. That should be fun. I actually enjoyed that close to launch for the DS. How about you, James? What would you pick up? Uh, I've got a Neo Geo Battle Coliseum for the PS2, and uh, actually the first Halo for PC. Halo PC, uh, they actually have a huge community still. A lot of people did uh, mods and have ported, or well, recreated original maps from Halo 3, Halo 2, Halo 4, and brought them to the PC. And they've done, like, texture mods, and there's patches to update the resolution and stuff like that. It's it's actually it's actually a pretty big community, so you might want to look into that. Halo Custom Edition. I had uh, quite a few pickups this week, but uh, the one I wanted to talk about was um, I had this guy online who had messaged me a while ago. It's been a couple weeks ago now, I guess, who needed an NES, has, had problems with the one he had. I don't know if it was a connector that failed or something, but was having issues with it. And so um, he was looking for, desperately looking for a modded modded NES, I guess. And by modded, I just mean refurbished, I guess. You know, disabling, disabling the lockout chip. And so I do that regularly to the consoles that I bring in and sell. So um, I ended up getting a copy of Conqueror's Bad Fur Day. Label's not great, but, uh, but it was a nice trade and really nice. Will you be adding that to your personal collection, or is that going to be going on the site? That is currently on the site. You can pick it up for, I believe, it's sixty-four ninety-nine at Thundercards.com. What a what a great plug there. 
Great price, too. How about you, Steve? What did you find this week? Uh, not, not exactly this week, but within this past, like, couple, three weeks, I've been... Uh, I, I work out of town a lot, and when I'm out of town, I don't really have a whole lot of time to go hunting, but when I'm home, that's pretty much all I do the, the entire time. And I have a friend that's actually getting out of collecting due to personal reasons. He just... He needs the money more than he needs the games, and I've pretty much been exclusively buying up his collection. Uh, the The last lot I bought from him, I think it was uh, it was about a good ten uh, original NES games, uh, Conquer's Bad Fur Day, and I believe I picked up. I think it was his Zelda DSi as well. Anybody have any uh, closing thoughts or anything that they wanted to say that we haven't touched on yet? Uh, yeah, if it's okay with you, Matt, I'd like to just go ahead and give a little teaser about our next episode. I would like to discuss the effect that the re-releases and the you know upcoming digital downloads and the eShop and everything, what kind of effect they have on the um, older original games, how what they do with the price, whether they make the demand greater or they bring the original's value way down. I you know, think we should discuss that next time. Yeah, I was actually a subscriber to Loot Crate for a while. Um, I recently canceled because obviously we got the twins on the way so we had to cut back some stuff. Uh, but I, I really think that would be a good topic for us to discuss next week. Just, just a lot of these subscriber boxes that are coming out geared toward gamers and geeks. Because there, there's quite a bit out here. Sounds like a plan. We'll add that to the docket. Um, one thing I want to make sure we touch on next week, and we talked about a little bit before we started tonight, but didn't quite get to it, is if there were any franchises that you felt at some point should have gotten a game and didn't, or even we can expand that and talk about any games that were single releases and really deserved a sequel but never got one. So that's something I'd like to talk about next week. All very good topics, and we'll get to those next week. I'd like to thank the Play On Podcast for for just, you know, like giving us some ideas and kind of being an inspiration for us, although they're quite professional and we're, we're assholes. But um, you can find them at planetarbitrary.com or on Twitter at Play On Podcast. Uh, I'd also like to thank Wit, Matt down there, with uh, Thunder Cards and Games, part of the Game Collecting Network. Um, he actually has a deal going on right now. I believe it's 10% off for GameCollecting.net members. I'd also like to thank Retro Game Swap and House of the Mouse for putting our chat in the sidebar. And I, I really just like to thank you guys for listening and listening to this bullshit for the last hour or so. If anybody wants to join, by all means, drop us a line on GameCollecting.net's forums. Um, hopefully next week our buddy SK Sin 7 will be back from Brazil, and we'll talk more about the video game database he's working on at VGDB.io. And that, that wraps it up for this evening, guys. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to mention our buddy Jacob Diaz from DJJD. You can find him on SoundCloud, DJJD Studios. He does our audio bumps. We take a couple clips that he makes, and he's got some badass video game remixes. He's also very good at doing the stuff himself, like uh, our intro track. He did that on his own. Um, he doesn't just do video game remixes, so check him out if you need any audio done. Uh, that's uh, soundcloud.com slash Studios. And um, I, I, I think that just wraps it up for this week, guys.